Hi, I'm Leah Small, and this is Virginia Voices, where you will hear first-person stories from people most affected by current politics, policy, and economic trends. We give Virginians outside the news a full stage to explore their thoughts and experiences beyond a few sound bites or paragraphs in a daily news story. Virginia Voices is a project of the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO. I'm proud to be from Appalachia because I know how to do things. I know how to hunt and I know how to fish. I know how to feed myself. And I have a love for the mountains and, and the trees and the flowers. I, I have a love for the squirrels and the rabbits that are here. And so to be part of, of Appalachia, I just I love that I was born here. 51-year-old Jamie Hale has lived in Giles County and southwest Virginia his entire life as did two generations of his family since 1779. Giles County, which borders West Virginia, is known for its scenery, mountain vistas, covered bridges, tranquil, deep woods. But for six years, noise and disruption from construction on the Mountain Valley Natural Gas Pipeline and dogged opposition of the project by environmentalists and area residents like Hale has cut through the county's rural quiet. It's overwhelming. It really is. Especially, you know, if you love mountains and you love trees and, and the animals, the plants and stuff, and then you're sitting and all you hear is the beeping and stuff. It just, it really gets under your skin. That's, that's the pipeline. We're about, we're about 1,100 feet away from that thing. The Mountain Valley Pipeline spans just over 300 miles between West Virginia and Southwest Virginia, winding through six counties in the Commonwealth and crossing hundreds of streams and wetlands and under private property. It's five years behind schedule and billions over its original budget, NVP says, and is finally expected to be operational in June. Significant delays were caused by challenges from environmental groups including a failed U.S. Supreme Court case to prevent project construction within the Thomas Jefferson National Forest. The pipeline has been hit with hundreds of environmental citations and has paid millions in state fines, as reported by the Associated Press. Environmentalists are concerned about water pollution and damage to ecosystems. Appeals by property owners and environmentalists continue in federal courts. Area residents are also concerned about safety. They fear the pipeline could rupture. A portion of the pipeline failed a pressure test in May. But supporters say the Mountain Valley Pipeline is crucial for energy security and reliability. The company says natural gas pipelines have the best safety record of any energy delivery system in the country, and the new fuel pipeline will be monitored constantly by a sophisticated high-tech system. Hale and many of his neighbors in Giles County have protested the pipeline, and I'm here to talk with him about how pipeline construction has upended his livelihood, family home, and farm. So, Jamie, you grew up in Giles County. What most stands out in your memories of being raised in this part of rural Appalachia? Uh, in, in this part, what stands out the most is, is the folks in this area, how how hard the people's had to work to, to survive and, and to have something, you know, people, people have really, uh, had a challenge in these areas to basically, you know, have a decent place to live. And your family, your family connections going back to 1779. Um, why did you decide to make your life here and continue that? Well, when, when you're born in some of these areas and, and you have no way out, you have no choice but to stay here. And, and then, then it becomes a love and, and you don't never want to leave. But to be born in this area and, and there's really no way out. How did you feel that there was no way out? And then when did the love come? Um, well, you know, there's just, there's no money for education. People, people really doesn't have the money to send their kids to colleges. Uh, so therefore you, you've got to start work at an early age. And, uh, 
but there's there's certain parts of of the area that you fall in love with first. It's the streams, the fishing, and the hunting, and the mountains, and and over a period of time, it's just the whole area itself is is something that you're you're wanting to be a part of. And tell me about where you worked and how you were able to have a livelihood here and how you maybe supplemented that livelihood. Well, most most of my life I've worked for minimum wage jobs. Uh, worked in a sewing factory, uh, worked uh, janitorial jobs. Uh, always, you know, minimum wage. Uh, I won't say low skill jobs, but manual labor uh, construction type stuff. So that's, that's basically how I've, I've been able to feed myself. And we're obviously at your home in your living room and you have farmland. It's our farm here. Uh, what made you decide to purchase your farm? What are you raising here and how big is it? Well, when me and me and my wife, we've been married for right around 24 years when uh, we decided that we needed to expand. You know, we had children. I was looking for a piece of land. And at that time, a lot of, a lot of areas were being subdivided and turned into housing areas. And so I was trying to find an area that was a little bit away from people. And, you know, my grand, my grandfather, had a farm when I was a kid, and so I always wanted to be around farm animals. And this area, you know, everybody has cows, and so I wanted to try my hand at farming. And so it, it took some time to find a piece of land, but uh, eventually ended up finding this property. But what are you raising here, and how it's it been like? Uh, at one time, I first when I first started with the farming, I raised raised goats and chickens, and then moved on to pigs up to the point that, that I was able to start buying some, some steers and raising a few few of those. It took me 10 years, you know, to get everything kind of situated and, and then the pipeline come to town and my water, my water, my ponds dried up and, and I found myself with no water in my house. I've lived here 16, 17 years since 2008. I bought this property and you know the freedom that comes along with it you know my, my nearest neighbors 600 some yards away i don't hear nothing out of them they don't hear nothing out of me you can hunt you can sit out on on your porch in your pajamas and drink coffee in the morning it's just the american dream you know at one time this this was a dream come true and and that american dream has basically turned into a nightmare since pipeline construction got underway in Giles County a little over six years ago, Hale's drinking water has been clouded by sediment. A natural spring used to water his animals stopped flowing, so he no longer keeps livestock. It's unclear what caused Hale's system to fail. The Virginia Department of Environmental Quality has not investigated the water contamination on Hale's property. The Roanoke Times has reported other incidents of drinking water being contaminated by erosion caused by pipeline construction. In March, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality issued a $34,000 fine against NVP for allowing sediment from construction to enter waterways and impact wetlands. The state agency cited inspection reports from September through December in 2023. NVP says that the issues were resolved quickly and didn't cause any permanent environmental damage. Most recently, NVP faced another $31,000 citation from the state in May for not installing erosion controls, which resulted in sediment contaminating creeks in Franklin County. NVP says it has put infrastructure in place to solve the problem. You want to see where the pond was first? Yeah. That's probably the closest thing. Oh, work. Water used to flow out of this car here. I'll show you it first. Uh, water used to, it, it could just barely a little bit of rain and this thing would run for days. But basically, that's where the water used to feed my ponds from. I saw, and that's a natural spring right there. Yes. Yeah, it's what we call a rainy day spring. And when I started getting a lot of these animals, I thought, well, I need to, I need to utilize this water. I need to, to, to do something to collect this water. And so that's when I, I built the pond and uh, and started collecting the water. And so 
roughly it had right around 10,000 gallons in it at one time. But the pond is now empty, a grassy pit with a solitary wooden bench where the bank used to be. Wow. Can you go back and, um, and tell us about the moment you first heard about the pipeline and that Giles County was in it, its path? Can you help us picture it? I found out about the pipeline in, in probably mid to late fall of 2017. And my neighbor told me that a pipeline construction company had contacted him and was wanting to do some surveying in this area for this natural gas pipeline, uh, which is frack gas. And so I didn't know nothing about it. And so I started doing some Googling and started trying to find out information about this pipeline. And then in early spring of 2018, uh, surveyors come into the area and started walking over people's property, uh, trying to survey things. And that's how I got involved. And, and when I really realized that this is reality, they're wanting to build a pipeline here. When my neighbor, you know, when he was, when we was discussing this pipeline project, he was like, I don't want him on my property. He was not interested in selling. Later on, I guess the money becomes so great that they had to take it. So these people, eventually, they, they sold their right away to, to this construction company. Can you tell me how else it's impacted your life and livelihood? Well, in, in 2018, when construction first started here, they, uh, they come in and they started cutting down trees. They brought equipment in and started, you know, clearing, clearing the, the trees out of the way. In, in, two, in 2018, we had record numbers of rainfalls. They had so many violations from, from, the, uh, from construction where they did not do sedimentation work. So a lot of the, the mud and stuff was allowed to leave their property. A lawsuit brought by the state of Virginia against NVP required the company to pay a $2.1 million penalty to the state for allowing sediment from construction to enter waterways in Giles and other counties during heavy rains in 2018. Well, first, first, um, you know, I didn't know who to contact. You know, they never, they never shared any information of who to talk to. Uh, didn't know nothing about the DEQ. You know, I'm not a very educated person. Uh, didn't know any local, you know, other than like the county administrator, and, and I, I talked to them about it. Uh, I talked to the local sheriff about it. You know, I talked to some of the workers, security people down here at the bottom of the driveway, but nobody, nobody had an answer. Uh, so basically, I, I just, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know who to, to contact. Speaking of water, I, I'll show you what my water looked like. This was some of my water from 2018. The sediment. And there is a film. The sediments are so white and so dense that I can't even see through the bottom of this. Turn it upside yes. down. It's like a snow globe. Like a snow globe. And that's supposed to be your drinking water. Yes. Yes. I, I have since installed a carbon filter on my drinking water side. Now, in 2018, that was, that was when water was starting to clear up. It was nothing but clay mud. This is what my water looks like today. Still some sediment. I was 18 days with no drinking water, no running water in my house for 18 days in 2018. I had all this livestock at the time, and the the two karst-fed ponds on my property were starting to go dry at that time. And so, therefore, basically, I went to this creek down here, Sinking Creek, for 18 days and drawed barrels of water using a rope and a bucket, and I brought it up here for my animals just because, you know, I, I had no other means of, of providing water for these animals up to the point that some of them died. I brought 200 gallons of water to the house every day for 18 days. When did you decide to be a part of the protest effort, and uh, how did that start? When, in 2018, I... 
I didn't know anybody was fighting this pipeline, and I was new to Facebook. Um, I found uh, there was a news story that a tree sit had went up in West Virginia, and on on the National Forest of Peters Mountain. Uh, and so I got on Facebook, and I was trying to find things, and eventually I found that there was a, a, a some folks had had erected a tree set uh, in the path of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And and when I found one organization that was fighting a pipeline, then I found another, and then I found another. And so it started with the. Uh, the tree sits on the Peters Mountain side. Then there was a monopod on the Virginia side of Peters Mountain. Basically, I I found myself in in the woods being part of these tree sets. You know, mostly carrying supplies, living in a tent. The National Forest they they closed a public road and and wouldn't allow us to walk up the road. Uh, then they made it to where you had to be 125 feet away from the road. And so people were kind of getting lost trying to navigate through the National Forest. And, and we're talking two miles through some heavily dense forests, real steep ridges. And so I basically, I made a trail from where we were allowed to park uh, through the National Forest. I, I Basically, I made a trail, you know, a makeshift trail to where people could navigate themselves till they could find the some of the tree sets, they called it the hell trail. And then the national force kind of found out about the trail. And then there's like, oh, it's the health and safety trail is what they named it as. And then they mapped it and kind of said that it was their idea to make the trail for people to safely move in and out of. Hale helped protesters, including activists calling themselves Deckard and Nutty, who erected monopods or tents on posts to block construction. I would meet people and I would, I would basically, I would guide them through the mountains and those folks would take supplies to the support camp. And uh, basically the support camp was 125 feet away from the monopod. And the monopod was surrounded by national force cops, you know, law enforcement. And they had a Quonset set up and they would basically live there. And, and for 57 days, the monopod stood to where they could not access that road to get to the top of the mountain where Deckard was living in the other tree set uh, on the West Virginia side of Peters Mountain. A monopod was a, about a 40-foot tall poplar tree pole. For 57 days, Nutty lived in, in this makeshift. Basically, they were on a cot at the top of this pole, and it had a, a piece of plastic as a rain fly. Um, you had actually dealt with an injunction due to your protesting um, from the pipeline parent company. Yes, in 2019, I was uh, I was issued an injunction through the marshal services. Uh, they showed up here at my house and delivered an injunction that basically said that I could not be within a thousand feet of the pipeline. In a Giles County Circuit Court filing for a civil injunction. NVP alleged that Hale threatened an NVP security officer in 2018. The court ordered Hale to not interfere with future construction. They they said I was I was being threatening. They said I was blocking access to their work sites. Um, they said I was stalking them. Uh, I know all these sites. Uh, I've never blocked accesses. The, there has been instances where I've stopped and took pictures, but there's more than one access in some of these locations. But I've showed up. I've took a lot of pictures. Basically, financially, I, I'm broke. So I have no means to financially afford lawyers and things of that nature. Actually, the, the, the kids living in the woods at, at one point here a couple years ago, they were actually feeding me been arrested twice. Hale pled guilty to a charge of disorderly conduct in Montgomery County for actions related to protests in 2019 and was court ordered to pay a $250 fine and to serve 12 months probation. An MVP statement said that Hale was also ordered by the court 
to not block access to easements, threaten pipeline workers, or commit acts of violence or intimidation against NVP or those working on the project. You know, your right to protest, your right to assemble is only if, you know, you stay out of the way, you keep your mouth shut, you don't, you don't, basically don't get involved. How has this saga changed how you think of authority, government, and politics? Well, recently I was at a little potluck get together where some friends was was there and one of them mentioned seven years ago Jamie would have had a Blue Life Matter sticker on the back of his truck you know and they were probably right. How else you've helped the protests? Well just just showing up and, and being a witness I have supported the the support camps I have carried supplies I have a little community space here by, by my house that it's it's my own little community garden and I grow a lot of produce and I share it with the people living in the forests. I will bake bread, I will grow a garden, I will give witness, I will paint some signs. Uh, I will show up every day, whatever it takes. I will I will sit in, and guard the gates uh, to these tree sits. I will take people in the mountains. That's how I feel as though, you know, is, is my greatest superpower. And and I love these people, you know, that that's the greatest thing of all. Uh, if it wasn't for this pipeline, I would have never met these folks. And I would not feel the way I feel towards these people if it was not for this project. So it's been a blessing and a cursing. I can't say that I'm I'm sorry that it's came and I and I, you know, because I've I've met some really some really great people that that really are bad ass you're still protesting you're still fighting but you've lost it's it's a done deal the pipeline is happening why are you still doing this there's not gas running through it yet so there is still that chance plan is to to allow my my son to inherit this property and and you know if I always worry, you know, if, if I hand this property down to my son, that him and his family could be living here and this thing explode. In order to lay down at night, I have to do everything that I possibly can do to try to make a difference. And so that gives me a determination. And two, there's, until, until there is nobody left to fight this pipeline, I will still be here. I will still be fighting this thing. How have your hopes and dreams for the future changed in light of all this? What is my hope for the future? That there will never be frack gas run through Appalachia. And, and I hope that, that with all the people that I've met fighting this pipeline project, I hope that one day, you know, that we, we can all sit down and, and say, we beat this pipeline. I'm host and producer Leah Small. Virginia Voices is a project of the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO. Executive producers are Christopher Tyree and Lewis Hansen. The podcast is edited by Chris and myself. Virginia Voices is made possible through a grant by Virginia Humanities and donors like you. You can read the story and see photos from today's show and past episodes on our website, vcij.org, which is linked in our bio. We hope that if you like these conversations, you'll subscribe to Virginia Voices, where we'll continue to share the stories of Virginia citizens whose lives are impacted by the news of the day. On behalf of everyone here at the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism, thank you for your time and support.